Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and to the remnant of the people. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem like nothing to you? Even so, be strong, Zerubbabel, the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, high priest. Be strong, all you people of the Lord, the Lord's declaration. Work, for I am with you, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. This is the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. For the Lord of hosts says this, Once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I'll shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver and gold belong to me, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first, says the Lord of hosts. I will provide peace in this place, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's an outline there uh, in your newsletters. Uh, Let me start off with a phrase you are all familiar with. Appearances can be deceiving. Uh, We know that phrase, and many of us might have actually experienced that phrase in our own lives, Uh, perhaps through a personal comment either made to us or by us, as we've been surprised at the capabilities of someone who looked incapable, perhaps even when we've met someone and the difference between the appearance and the performance surprises us. Appearances can be deceiving and they can be disappointing too, can't they? In moments like this, what we hope for isn't what we got. What looks like one thing turns out to be something else far less exciting or substantial. God's people are having a case of this in Haggai. The appearance of God's building project is profoundly disappointing from where they stand. And God speaks to them and he reassures them, appearances can be deceiving. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It's deceiving to open the Bible. Uh, It looks like a book with black type on pages, but it's actually the source of living life. It's uh, the source of salvation. Uh, It's your revelation of your nature. Uh, It's sharp and it divides, it exposes and lifts up. Father, appearances can be deceiving and even disappointing. Help us to hear your reassurance today in your living word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, God's people are back in the land. Uh, God's people have come back with one purpose, Ezra chapter 1, verse 4, to rebuild the temple. Uh, The temple was that great symbol of God's desire to live with his people and the great symbol of how serious sin is. As we heard last week, the temple was put simply a living statement, if you like, a big picture of God's grace. God's people have been back and building for 19 years, but they haven't been building God's house, have they? They've been building their own houses, and that's revealed what is most significant to them, and it's not God. Their houses are flash. God's house is in ruins. God rebukes them. God confronts them. God calls his people back to the building project that they were sent there for, the one that shows his significance. God's people hear and they fear and they get on with the job. Well, they gathered together again. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, They're about seven weeks after the first time Haggai spoke. The best guess is probably October 17, 520 B.C., Verse 1, on the 21st day of the seventh month, 
the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Now, it's, it's important to actually go and stand in the dust of Jerusalem at this point. Why are God's people gathered together? Uh, in the calendar for God's people, the seventh month is the busiest festival month. It's when there's most going on. Uh, the day we're talking about here is the second last day of the Festival of Booths, Leviticus 23. It's where all of God's people would move out of their homes and live for a period of time in little tents made of palm branches just to remind themselves that God provided for them when they wandered in the desert. It's also a festival known as the Festival of Ingathering, again, Leviticus 23, where God's people would gather together at a certain time, three times a year, and give to God the first fruits of all of their harvest and crops. It's also the month where they celebrated the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 17, that great sacrifice where animals showed that they bore the sin for God's people, where God demonstrated his grace. So you've got to get all that. That's why they're gathered. They're gathered because of all of those festivals. And there's another layer to their memories because 400 years ago on this very day, Solomon opened the first temple. Can you imagine all of those emotions and historical memories swirling around inside you? They've been rebuilding the temple for the last three to four weeks. They're gathered to remember God's provision, God's abundant provision, God's grace, that great first day when the first temple opened. And the word of the Lord comes. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, to the remnant of the people. Who's left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem like nothing to you? God's word comes and it goes to the leadership down. And the Lord asks three pointed questions. Who's left among you who saw this house in its former glory? Uh, We heard in that Ezra 3 reading how those people reacted when they initially set down just the foundation stone 19 years earlier. There are some there amongst God's people in their 70s and 80s, even 90s, who remembered the first temple, that magnificent structure that Solomon took seven years to build with 180,000 workers. They remember what it looked like and they wept when they saw that first foundation stone laid in Ezra 3 as they came back. They remember the good old days and they've gathered for this festival. Like, Look at what is standing in front of them after three to four weeks and how does it look to you now? Well, it looks pitiable, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a garbage tip. It's a heap of rubble. Three to four weeks by hand. You wouldn't have even made a dent, would you? All those bricks are there with the scorch marks of the flames from when they left the land. It's hardly a statement of how big God is. Doesn't it seem like nothing to you? (laughs) Appearances are disappointing, aren't they? Doesn't look like it used to. Gathered together to celebrate a festival of harvest, and that hasn't been a good harvest. Not for 19 years. Gathered to remember God being with his people in the desert and now they're just destitute. Gathered together remembering the temple as Solomon opened it that first time. Everything seems so disappointing. The building project looks so insignificant. Piles of rubble, maybe a stone dressed, all dwarfed by their own homes back there all dwarfed by their own memories and their own dreams and their own expectations. Appearances are so disappointing, aren't they? A psalm yearned for the good old days when they could go back to what had been, when the buildings looked like they remembered, when things returned to what they'd once enjoyed. Some just couldn't quite work out the fuss. This, this is God's house. And some were just plain underwhelmed. Does that sound familiar? 
Does that strike a chord? And into that disappointment, God speaks. Verse 4, even so, be strong, Zerubbabel, the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, the Lord's declaration. Work, for I am with you, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Even so. Now, let, let me share with you a word in these present circumstances. And notice how he starts with the leadership and works his way down. Zerubbabel, be strong. Joshua, be strong. A people, be strong. God's used that word before, that phrase, hasn't he? Be strong. When, when did he use that? Well, when Joshua, the first Joshua, led them into the promised land. Be strong and courageous. I'm with you. And they're meant to remember what happened back then. Notice what God tells them to do. He doesn't just deal with their hearts and their, hand, their minds. He deals with their hands. Get to work. It would be easy to yearn for the good old days and to circle the wagons and to lament the state of the current building project. With disappointment in front of them, it would be easy to give up building God's house and return to their own projects. With the pile of rubble in front of them, it would be easy to become inward-looking and not appreciate the impact that this building will have on the whole entire world. Don't retreat. Keep working. It's feasible. It's possible because why is it possible? Look what God reassures them of there. As he said up in chapter 1, verse 13, I'm with you. I am right with you. It's not a placebo, is it? <laughs> it's not an empty statement. It's not kind of like one of those rallying cries where you know the outcome, but really, let me just say something positive. Look at verse 5. This is the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt. And when my spirit is present among you, don't be afraid. Remember your history. What happened when they came out of Egypt? They ended up at Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, God made a promise to them, you're my mob, I will never neglect you, abandon you. In fact, there was a proving moment in those days, wasn't there? Because when Moses came down from the mountain, what were God's people doing? They were worshipping a golden calf. God's up there saying, I'll be steadfast. They're down the bottom being flaky. And at the very moment where God is within his rights to walk away, what does he do? I'm still with you. I'll judge you, I'll rebuke you, but I'm still with you. And so the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire go out daily. They wake up and there's manna and there's quail. And when they need water, God taps a rock and out it comes. Their very existence back in the land with Haggai the prophet speaking to you says what? <laughs> I've kept my promise. I've never left you. Even though you wandered, I'm always here. In fact, did you notice something even greater in what God said there? Did you notice what God said there? My spirit is present among you. That's an amazing development because in the past, God's spirit was with the leaders and with the artists. Now it's with the whole people. So don't be afraid. I'm standing here with you. Get on with the job. In fact, God then lays out, I'm at the next point on the outline, verses 6 to 9, God then lays out not just an encouragement in the present, but a vision of the future. Look at verse 6. For the Lord of hosts says this, Once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I'll shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come and I'll fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver and gold belong to me, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first, says the Lord of hosts. I'll provide peace in this place, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Do you see how God starts that in verse 6? Did you notice what he said? Once more in a little while. I I'm going to do what I've done in the past. It's a reassurance. We've got to remember that God has a track record, <laughs> a track record made clear in the Bible of working in time and space for his people. In a little while, I'm going to shake the world. I'm going to shake the nations. In fact, when you go back through the Bible, 
Whenever God comes, the world shakes. It's something I've only realized this week. Go back through the Bible, and when God comes to deal with his people, the world shakes. Think about the end of Exodus. As God brings the people out through those plagues, the nation of Egypt was shaken. Think about when God met Moses up on Mount Sinai. What are we told? The whole earth, the mountain shook and God's people were in fear. And when God does this shaking, he'll provide everything they need to build this house. God will do it, not because they need it, but just because he can. All the wealth of the world is mine. And he'll do it to make this house most glorious. This pile of rubble, it's going to be the most glorious house, showing how most significant God is. And do you notice what will come out of this house? There'll be peace. The end point of the plan is very clear. I'm coming to dwell with you. And when I do, the world will see my greatness and peace will come. God reassures his people in the present, doesn't he? God reminds them that appearances can be deceiving even as they are disappointing. I'm with you. I've got a track record. Get on with the job. And then he gives his people a vision of the future. What will this house look like? You just can't imagine how significant this house will be because out of this house will come peace for the world. So what are we meant to do with a passage like this? How are we meant to apply it in 2022 in Narrabah? Now, on the one hand, uh, we can make the very easy jump, and I think it's a good jump, to say appearances are disappointing. We know that, don't we? As they gathered for the festival of booze, for the festival of ingathering, as they remembered Solomon's work, as they remembered the Day of Atonement and were so profoundly disappointed in the building project. We know that, don't we? We know the lure of the good old days. We know the despair of a building project that just, really? Bible reading and prayer? On the other hand, if we do just make that jump, we don't deal with verses 6 to 9, do we? Because there is a future plan. Oh, the temple didn't reach the heights that God's people dreamed of in their time. And yet by the time we get to Ezra 5 and 6, the treasure of the nations is flowing into Jerusalem because Darius has just said, hey, um, let's clear the Persian treasury to support the building of that temple. And the wealth of the nations came and the temple was built And God had done as he promised in the immediate short term. By the time of Jesus, the Romans had taken over from the Persians and the Herods were ruling. And now let me tell you, the temple was big and shiny and glossy. And angels turned up one night and they decided to go and sing in some paddocks to some shepherds about the birth of God's promised king. And that king was born in a stable that just, ooh, pew. And it smelt in a small town, a birth to a woman about whom rumours circulated in a town not her own. That king had to flee when only a young boy because his life was threatened. That king grew up and lo and behold, he worked as a, yeah, a carpenter for 18 years. That king started his public work in hillbilly country away from the capital in an area part of a little province of the whole Roman Empire. That king hung out with prostitutes, tax collectors, the poor, the homeless, and the outcasts. That king was rejected by his hometown. That king was rejected by the leaders of his own community. That king was executed in public humiliation. That king died, abandoned by his friends. That king was buried in the ground. Appearances can be so disappointing, can't they? That king was descended from David. 
That king looked the devil in the eye and told him to go away, and he did. That king fulfilled prophecy after prophecy. That king healed the sick, stilled the waves, and cast out demons. That king raised dead people to life, gave sight to the blind, and enabled the paralyzed to dance. That king died, and the earth was shaken. That king was buried, and his grave was opened, and he walked out. That king is the exact image of God, his only boy. That king is enthroned on high with all power and authority because he beat death. That king came to serve, giving his life as a ransom for many. That king is God, and he brings peace by forgiving sins. That king is Jesus. And appearances can be deceiving, can't they? Jesus is everything that God described in Haggai 2, 1 to 9, and that house is more glorious than it's ever been. And out of that house flows peace. And as that house ascends to live with his father, what does he command his followers to do? Go and shake the world. Go and shake the world. And I'll be with you by my spirit. And so here we are, people connected to Jesus, trusting that he's God and beaten our sin. And what are we? We're the world's foolish things, 1 Corinthians 1. We're the world's insignificant and despised things, the things viewed as nothing, 1 Corinthians 1. We're people who are groaning and suffering and subjected to futility, Romans 8. We're like dispensable cutlery clay jars who carry the death of Jesus in our bodies, struck down, persecuted, pressured, perplexed, 2 Corinthians 4. We use words and not the latest technology. We use humility and not power. We proclaim a crucified Lord and not an overlord with wealth. We serve rather than dominate. We mourn rather than boast. We're peacemakers and meet, not warmongers and proud. We woke up this morning and we struggled with sin. We stumbled this week, one step forward and three back. We are exhausted, tired and downtrodden. Appearances are disappointing, aren't they? We're being built into a house for the living God, Ephesians 2. We're more than conquerors because of a resurrected Lord. We proclaim a message that brings life to the eternally dead. We're the co-workers of God, the first fruits of a new humanity. We look forward to a future that cannot be shaken because one day Jesus will return and the earth will be swept up and the immovable kingdom of God will be displayed and the sons of glory will be revealed. We're worn out, aren't we, by the work of building God's kingdom? We can be disappointed when our words fall flat or are flatly rejected. We are frustrated when, out of Narrabri's population, only 300 people, if that, meet in church on a good weekend. We lament when we see how the world dwarfs, despises and dominates the people of God. We are saddened when friends and family don't grasp the goodness of Jesus. We are disappointed at how feeble our progress in godliness is. We are tempted to retreat to the good old days. We are tempted to go back to what looks shiny in the world. And then we look at our history, don't we? And we look at what God has done. And then we listen to what he says about the future. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us hold on to grace. By it we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. We listen to the words as Paul wondered about Corinth. And the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Don't be silent. For I'm with you and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in this city. We see and hear this and we're not afraid, are we? We know our history. And so we labour with the good news of Jesus. God is with us 
and we are strong. We hold on to grace and proclaim it and practice it. And so we persevere in the building project whose appearance is so deceiving, isn't it? Let me pray. Father, forgive us for when we are sucked in by appearances being so disappointing. Reveal to us that appearances are deceiving and that you are working through the insignificant to bring a kingdom that is not shaken. Father, that's us because we are joined to Jesus who beat death. Please remind us that you are with us. Please lift up our hearts so that we are not afraid. Please move our hands so that we work. And we pray that you'll bring many of your people in this town to know and love Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.